Welcome back. In this tutorial, we're going to continue developing techniques for working with curves and curved design elements in our furniture designs. We're going to move beyond simply constructing circles and full ellipses and start using parts of circles or even parts of ellipses to be components of more complex curves that can in many cases greatly enhance our furniture designs in sometimes fairly subtle ways. In order to begin down that path, a good place to start is to develop a technique for laying out families of curves, families of arcs, of different radii. And you can think of this as a visual scale of arcs, much in the same way as we developed our visual scale of rectangles. Now, I would typically not construct something like this as a part of a design so much as I'd construct it as a reference to use. And the idea is, is, imagine we have some line segment from A to B. We want to develop a series of arcs that set upon AB as a chord of a circle. The simplest one to lay out first is the arc that's known as the sixth of a circle. And the reason for that is that if we measure, a little more accurately, if we measure the baseline length of that cord and used that construct the third vertex of an equilateral triangle, and that third vertex becomes the center of a circle, and if we were to trace that circle out all the way around, 360 degrees, then this arc that spans between A and B is one-sixth of that circle. It's one-sixth of the full circumference. And that's a very common arc that we construct to set upon a line segment. It's often a starting point if we, that we use if we want to create an arc that's going to span between two points. <clears throat> However, sometimes that arc is much too curved. We would want to try a slower one like some of these arcs. And other times it's not curved enough and we'd want to find a faster arc. And so <clears throat> the way to do that is you, know, you want to be sort of systematic about it and pick the ones that are somewhat easy to construct first. And that's why I view this, this graphic as the practical visual scale of, of angles because we we just take a selection of angles that are reas or, or of arcs that are reasonably easy to construct. So the, the next one that is particularly easy to construct is the half arc that spans A to B because that's just the semicircle that uses A to B as its diameter. And so if we wanted to use if we wanted to find the center of that arc, all we really need to do is find the midpoint of AB. Fingers aren't working quite as fast as I want them to. Still kind of chilly at night here in Montana. So if I find that midpoint between A and B, check that it's the midpoint, then that also forms, you know, the midpoint of a diameter is the center of the circle, so it, because you can't really see that, midpoint of the uh, diameter is the center of the circle, and so it certainly traces that arc around. So that's another one that's relatively easy, a, a re relatively easy arc to construct. If we want to construct 
this third of an arc, the arc that's the third of the way around the circle, then what we're really looking at is we're trying to find the circle that circumscribes this equilateral triangle that we've already constructed. And while we can, we can find that, all we need to do is bisect these two sides with a perpendicular bisector and see where they intersect. And that's, that's a construction that we've done enough that I'm not going to repeat it here, but notice that that point that I've just chosen there is certainly the center of that arc. It traces it out. We can see that it traces that third of an arc, um, third of an arc, a circle, a third of a circular arc. Okay, and those are the three, I guess, quote unquote, fast arcs, highly curved arcs that I would bother constructing just with a compass, and maybe a straight edge, if I was in a position where I needed to do that. The others that are down here, the slower ones, they're not really fractions of a circle. Where they, where they come from is I take the radius of the third of an arc, I'm sorry, the radius of the sixth of an arc, the perfect sixth, the first one that we found. Then I come down here to a scale and I double it. Mark it off twice. So, okay, well, if I've got that, go ahead and measure that doubled scale right, and figure out where the center of that arc with that radius would be. So I, I put one point of my compass on A, sweep an arc, put the point of the compass on B, sweep another arc, and I find that their intersection is right down here. And then, let's see if I can draw this without getting my hand, or scribe this without getting my hand in the way. I trace out this faint arc that you can see here that says d equals 2r, the, or the radius equals, equals 2r. So it's, it's, that's an arc with a radius that's twice this basic sixth of an arc radius. All right, and we can see that gives me a much gentler curve, much less curvature to it. And you know, if, if I can step off, where's my compass? Step off one of the one six radius a second time to get, you know, twice that radius, I could certainly do it a third time, right? And so, you need to start getting a bigger compass to do that, but if I measure those three steps, ah, page is moving on me. If I measure three of those radii of the sixth of an arc, and then do the same thing, transfer those radii over here from A and B and see where those arcs intersect here on this spring line. Well, that gives me a new center for an even gentler, less curved arc, a slower one. So that's three times the radius. And generally speaking, that's really all I would bother to construct. Although you can see here, maybe on this diagram, that I went ahead and stepped off my sixth of an arc radius another time. So this full length of this scale here that you can barely see between my fingertips here, that's four times the radius of this sixth of an arc. And that actually ends up being off the page. Um, so, and it also exceeds the, any reasonable size of a compass that I've got. So um, I think I, when I drew this, this graphic, I actually used a long, 
ruler with a couple of trammel points on it to swing that even faster arc. And what I think is maybe visible to you on the screen, depending on how big of a screen that you're looking at, is that that arc that's generated with a radius that's four times the sixth of an arc radius, it, on this full-size page scale, there's only about a millimeter of difference millimeter of separation at most between that and the th three times the radius of a sixth of an arc arc. So those two are barely, you know, if you saw them in two separate contexts, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference between the two. And that's why I usually don't bother to create the fourth. You're getting to the point where it's such a flat curve that it's, you might as well not have a curve at all. Okay. If you don't take all the time to talk about constructing this visual scale of arcs. And you've got some skill at, you know, create, constructing the three fast radii and then just multiplying the sixth of an arc radius for these slower uh, radius arcs. You can whip a scale like this out pretty quickly. And then it serves as a pretty decent visual reference to give you a sense if you're trying to span an arc between two points in one of your designs, how much curvature is enough for your application? You can look at a picture like this comparatively and say, you know, I think a sixth of an arc is going to be too fast, so maybe I'm going to draw an arc whose radius is twice that of the sixth. Uh, or if it's not enough curvature, go to something more severe like a third of an arc or even half an arc or, or something in between. And this, this can, quite frankly, get you by for most of the situations that you would want to be in. On the other hand, you might find that you are just bound and determined to make sure that you can have a, a true visual scale of arcs where the radii range from a half a circle to a third to a quarter, which is not pictured here, to a sixth to a fifth, or to a fifth to a sixth, to a seventh to an eighth to a ninth, on up to however far you feel like going. And what, what those arcs are, are the spacings, the steppings around a circle between vertices of regular polygons that are inscribed inside of that circle. And so if you really want to come up with that kind of a visual scale of arcs, then what you need to be able to do is construct regular polygons that are inscribed inside of various circles with a given side link, because they're all going to have this segment AB as a common side length. Now, that is a task that appears in the elements. Euclid spends a whole book on trying to give you techniques for constructing various types of regular polygons. And others after him have come along and really shown what's possible. Those, t those tasks as constructions, it turns out, can be pretty tedious. So if you were really wanting to do that with nothing but a compass and straight edge, you'd better practice your accuracy and get your mind ready for the idea that you're going to be at it for a while. And so for those of you that don't want to make that kind of commitment. Well, there's always the sector. And so far on our sector, we've only used this linear scale. On my sector, that is the pair of black lines with markings on them that are equally spaced, ranging from 1 to 13. And that's called the line of lines. But the astute among you have probably noticed that my sector has two other scales on them. And one that's of particular interest to us right now is the line of polygons. And that's the one that's blue and it's got a pair of regular hexagons inscribed under them to let you know that, that that's what you're working with. And so we're gonna see in just a minute how we could construct a true visual scale that's more complete than this one, just using nothing but the sector. Okay, so what you see in front of you now is very carefully drawn. Visual scale of arcs, that's this set of arcs up here spanning between the same segment A and B, color-coded for your viewing pleasure. 
But in addition to those arcs, I've actually extended the circles for each arc all the way around. And we can see that these circles, you know, have increasingly larger and larger radii. Um, and the circles are color coded as well as the regular polygons that are inscribed in between them. So we can see that, you know, the half arc doesn't have a polygon at all. It's just got a diameter inscribed in it. The third of an arc, the red circles, has this regular equilateral triangle inscribed in it. The quarter of an arc in orange has a square inscribed in it. And all, so far, all of these polygons have the same side length. That, that, those lengths are congruent to the segment AB. And we move on from the square to a regular pentagon, a regular hexagon, a regular septagon, seven-sided, regular octagon, nonagon, decagon, whatever an 11-sided figure and 12-sided figure is called. I encounter them so infrequently that I, I don't even really bother to remember. All right, and so we definitely don't want to try to construct all of these. In fact, we would find that if we studied um, studied some algebraic geometry, we'd see that some of those regular polygons are impossible to construct with just a compass and straight edge. But if you've got a sector, you can construct them. Here's how. You would want to take your compass, this is the one here, that is, nope, Maybe I don't have one that's set anymore. Yeah, I probably don't. You want to take your compass that is set to the segment length AB. All right? And let's suppose I wanted to construct the center of the circle, locate the center of the circle that has the six-sided, you know, regular hexagon inscribed in it with side length equal to AB. Well, we already know how to do that. That's where we just construct this equilateral triangle by scribing two arcs of the same length, AB, to intersect one from A, one from B, and they're going to intersect at the point that forms the center of can barely see it, me tracing out this green circle. Okay. And inside of that green circle, we can see that there's a one, two, three, four, five, six-sided polygon, regular polygon that's in it. All right, so this, this length is going to be important. This length that may be is one that we're going to want to keep. If I want to construct any other polygon on this figure by finding the center of the circle that that polygon is going to be inscribed in, then what I need to do is open my sector up so that this segment length AB will stretch between the sixes. And not those sixes. I've made that mistake before and regretted it. These sixes. The sixes on the line of polygons. So I'm no longer working on the linear scale, the line of lines, I'm working on the line of polygons. And I'm making, my, making sure my compass spans between the sixes, which stands for, this is the side length of the regular hexagon. This is the radius, really, of the circle that inscribes, that circumscribes this regular hexagon of the side length. So if I want to find the radius of, let's say, the octagon, then I want to keep my, my sector set to the position that it's at. But then I want to go and uh, let's, I want to go, I, I, I take that back. I don't want to set this this compass, this <laughs> I don't want to set this sector in the position that it's at anymore. I want to keep my polygon side length, but I want to position it so that it is on the eights.
on this line of polygons. And then I will take some other compass, set that down here to the sixes. And that is my radius. Okay, so we'll check. I swing an arc from A, same arc from B, it intersects right here at what is the center for the blue circle that contains the regular octagon. My compass is a little bit off because the holes are worn out on this poster. I've used it a few times. All right, so let's, let's unpack those steps a little bit carefully. If I want to find the center of a circle that circumscribes, that contains a regular polygon of some given side length, then what I need to do is take that side length and put it between the numbers on the line of polygons that represents the number of sides I want on my polygon. Okay, so I'm always going to take the distance between A and B here and I'll put it between the eights if I want an octagon. I'll put it between the fives if I just want a pentagon. I'll put it up here between the twelves if I want a twelve-sided figure. Once I do that, I take another compass and go back and measure the distance between the sixes in order to get the radius of the circle that circumscribes that polygon. Okay, because then if I draw that circle, then I can take this length AB and just step it around the perimeter of that circle. I'm trying to do this left-handed and blind. Uh, perimeter of the circle in order to see that it really does partition that circle into eight equal chords. So that's why this blue cord that you can probably barely see in the video, I can barely see it, and it's right here in front of me, is one-eighth of the circle. All right, and you can do this for any number of sides. And I think, you know, it's probably worth doing this once. I've, I, I drew this poster a couple of years ago now, and I've really been unwilling to go back and do it again. And it does serve as a decent very complete visual reference of all the fractional parts of a circle that are arcs subtending this, this segment AB. All right, and so I, I do get this very nice visual scale of arcs going from ultra slow at 1 12th to as fast as you're gonna get at 1 half. And it is somewhat useful, especially on the upper end. I can compare a half to a third to a quarter to a fifth, down here to a sixth, the green arc. And there's a noticeable difference between those. But as I start getting into these arcs that are faster than a sixth, less curved than a sixth, they really start blending together. And, you know, one of them is just as good for practical purposes as really either one on either side of it. So, you know, I, I really only fall back to this scale of arcs when I'm trying to select arcs for a design task uh, to span between two points. I really only fall to this or look to this, this poster every so often. Most of the time, my practical scale of arcs is enough to give me an idea of how fast or how slow of an arc I should choose to connect two points with a, with a curve. Before we move on to piecing arcs together, whether they're circular or elliptical, and we'll need to see how we build up elliptical arcs as well, 
it's worth looking at one other way that we can generate circular arcs. And, and so far, most of the circular arcs we've looked at have just been arcs of different speeds, you know, in our visual scale of arcs, that connect the endpoints of some given line segment. So all we're doing is forcing the arc to pass through two points, and then we, we basically control the radius of that arc as another parameter to you know go more curved or less curved. But sometimes you might actually want to add more criteria into the shape of the arc. And you might want your arc to fit inside of a rectangle just like we have here, where it, its endpoints meet the endpoints of, a, of the one base of the, the rectangle, AD. And then the apex of the arc is tangent to the midpoint of the opposite edge of that same rectangle. And that's an arc that is inscribed inside of that rectangle. This is particularly useful for creating different types of curved archways. Now, we've seen ways to construct this, this before. We can draw two triangular lines that connect the midpoint to A and the midpoint to D. I've only drawn one here. We can find the perpendicular bisectors of those midpoints, and those should intersect right here at the center of this circular arc. So then you could, once you know the center, you can set a compass from the center to this corner of the, the rectangle, and then just draw the arc. Or we could, um, you know, draw this perpendicular bisector at the midpoint up here, draw this diagonal here, and, you know, copy this angle over to here, and then shoot this leg until it intersects this perpendicular bisector, and uh, that should intersect with the center of the circle as well. We've, we've encountered both of those constructions when working through the propositions from book three of the elements. And those, those work fine for doing this, this kind of a uh, construction, for inscribing a circular arc inside of a rectangle. Well, they work fine until you have a very large layout problem. So imagine that you had a very large piece of furniture that needed a arc on it. Maybe it was like a large headboard of a bed, or maybe it's an architectural element. It's an archway um, over top of a entryway from one room to another. So these things, you know, something like that could be 10, 12 feet wide and, and um, maybe three or four feet high. And you're not going to do that with a compass and a straight edge. Um, it's a very big compass and straight edge, and most people don't have those, and even if you did have one that large, you probably wouldn't want to try to manipulate it. And so it turns out that you can build a tool out of basically just two straight edges. And it, here's, I've, I've made one that, you know, if it holds together throughout this one demonstration, I'm going to be happy. You know, it's, I did my best with the finest green painter's tape I could find rotting in a corner of my, my shop. Um, the way you, you, you construct this is that we take one beam of this linkage, that's my silver ruler, and run it along this diagonal from A, bottom left corner of the rectangle, up to the midpoint of the opposite side. All right, so you want it running along that. And then the other beam of this linkage should be running parallel or, or right, you know, coincident with the top edge of the rectangle. And it looks like I'm a little off. I did the best I could taping these things together, but uh, it doesn't seem like it really wants to stick. All right. And so how do you make this thing draw an arc? Well, what you do is you either imagine that there is a pin here at the midpoint sticking into the paper, a pin here at A and a pin here at D. Or you go out and get a pin and drive it through, or three pins and drive them through those points. Either one works. And so if I actually did that, if I had pins or nails through those points, what I'd want to do is that I'd want to make sure 
that this black ruler is riding along the pin at the midpoint and this silver ruler is riding along this pin at the corner. And every so often, I'm going to go to the angle between, you know, the vertex of the angle between these two beams. I'm just going to make a mark. And then I could move things along, make sure that black ruler is aligned at the midpoint, silver ruler is aligned at point A, and I'm going to make another mark. And then just repeat. And the other way is that if I actually had the two pins here, I don't want to do that and drive them into my nice tabletop, but if I had them, then what I could do is kind of hold this pencil in the vertex right here of the two rulers and like slide it along, trying to make sure that usually it helps to hold it here, make sure that this leg is riding on this pin, this leg is riding on this pin. And I can't really do that with no pins and just two hands. But if I do that, rather than just having individual marks that fall at different points along the curve that I'm trying to construct, I would actually trace out the curve that I'm trying to construct. And I would get this half of the arc as I slid from M, slid the vertex from M to A. And if I wanted this arc, I would just do the opposite. I would I would make sure the silver ruler is riding along M and the black ruler is riding along D down here. And periodically make my marks. We'd see that eventually we're getting dots that follow along the circular arc. And we could connect those with a smooth curve. And so that works. That will actually give me points that fall exactly along these circular arcs. And if I want a real accurate representation of that circular arc that is inscribed in my rectangle, I just need to make more marks as I go along. Or physically drive pins through A, M, and D and slide this whole linkage along those pins. And this is something that can work on fairly large scales. You know, if you had a big four by eight sheet of plywood and you wanted to inscribe an arc in the top half of it, in the two by eight strip of it, then all you need to do is drive nails in the, the well, drive nails near the, th the two corners and the midpoint of the, uh, of the midline of that sheet of plywood and then make a linkage like this out of your straight pieces of framing lumber, like, uh, you know, maybe a couple of two by sixes or even one bias because they'd probably be a little bit lighter. And then get a couple of buddies to help you ride that whole linkage that you construct, you know, screw it together so that it's rigid at that intersection and just have them ride, them, ride it along the pins with you as you hold a, a marker or something in there. And that's going to trace that line out on a fairly large scale piece of material. You can come in then with a jigsaw and, and um, cut it smooth and there's your circular arc. So this, this can be a very um, useful technique when you're trying to construct an arc like this on a scale that's much larger than just what happens on your paper where the compass and straight edge is still useful. And so with that in mind, we might ask, well, that, that's great. That's cool that this thing seems to work. But why does it work? Well, that's what all these numbers and letters are all about. And so the idea that we need to wrap our minds around, let's make some sense of this, this picture here. I've got this rectangle, and I've got the arc already inscribed in the rectangle. And what I'm trying to claim is that this angle here, which has one leg of it riding on A, one right of it, leg of it riding on M, and then the vertex of it is riding on the arc itself, it's got some angle, angle APM. And what I need to demonstrate is that that angle is equal to this angle right here, 
A and C because that's the angle that I used to, you know, I aligned my silver ruler along that diagonal. That was A to M. And then I aligned my black ruler along the top of the rectangle, M to C, and then attached the thing. So this is the angle that I was trying to slide along where this leg is riding on the midpoint, this leg is riding on A, and this vertex is supposedly tracing out my circular arc. So I'm saying, well, look, if you pick an arbitrary point P along this part of the arc and then form this angle, if that linkage that I've just demonstrated really does work accurately no matter what, then this angle should be equal to this angle because it's a rigid link linkage that, that angle shouldn't change. So we ought to be able to prove that. And it turns out that we can, and we can with the aid of some facts about triangles and the sums of their, their angles, as well as a couple of propositions, namely Proposition 20 and Proposition 22 from Book 3 of the Elements. And so let's, let's kind of unravel some of what's going on here. In order to demonstrate that these two angles are equal to each other, we probably ought to see what these angles are equal to in terms of other things in our, 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 our diagram. So first thing is that I have right here, A, P, M, E is a quadrilateral that's inscribed in a circle. And so proposition two tells me that if, I, if I've ever got a quadrilateral inscribed in a circle, then opposite angles of that quadrilateral always sum to 180 degrees, or pi radians if you prefer. So this angle, A, P, M, and this angle, A, E, M, must sum up to 180 degrees. And that's what I'm saying right here. So I'm just relating it to some other angle, uh, angles in the, in the uh, diagram. But I don't really want to mess with this angle that's way down here that much. And one way I can exchange it for something else is say, well, look, A, E, M is an angle of an arc that sets on the circumference of the circle, that its vertex is on the circumference of the circle. And then right here, A to the center of the circle, to M, A, O, M, that's an angle of the same arc or the same chord, APM, yet its vertex is at the center. And what I know from, from Proposition 20 of Euclid's Elements, Book 3, is that angles setting at the center and angles sitting at the circumference, as long as they subtend the same arc, the central angle must be double the measure of the, the circumferential angle. So this has to be twice this, All right? So instead of just saying APM plus AEM is 180 degrees, this plus this is 180, or pi radians, this angle, APM, plus half of this angle also has to equal pi radians, or 180 degrees. And that's what's, what's going on here. So now I've related this angle that I want to know something about to this other angle that's a little bit closer to what all is going on up here. Okay, so I'm going to store that information aside for a little bit and then I'm going to come back to it. So I'm going to make a couple of other observations. This segment here, OA, and this segment, OM, those both radiate out to the center, to the upper, uh, circumference of the circle from the center, so they are both radii of the same circle. So this triangle, AOM, must be isosceles because those two sides, AO and MO, or OA and OM, depending on the direction you look at them, they're equal. They're both radii. So any, tri any triangle with two legs equal to one another is isosceles. And we know that isosceles triangles have equal angles at their base. So angle MAO and angle AMO must, must be equal to one another. I, I um, wrote that backwards here. 
this should be, yeah, M-A-O-A-M-O. -A -A so, uh, I did write it. Yeah, I did write it correctly. I just said it backwards a minute ago. Okay, so anyway, these two angles are the ones that have to be equal to each other. And then we know that any, any triangle, the sum of the three angles in the triangle is 180 degrees, pi radians. So, um, angle OAM and OMA, or however we're calling them, I guess, MAO and AMO, keep reading them backwards, those two plus the central angle AOM, those must equal 180 degrees, and that's this statement right here. But, where is the central? This is the central angle. These are the two that are alike. These two are the same. So I might as well just replace this sum here with two times AMO. And so if I rearrange that, the central angle, AOM, is going to be equal to the pi radians, 180 degrees, minus these two, which simplify to minus 2 AMO. All right, and that's useful because this expression here and this expression here that we figured out a minute ago, they both involve this angle AOM. AOM, AOM, it appears in both places. So I can take what I know about AOM from this formula, substitute it into here. And that's what's happened here. AP. So we already know that angle APM, the angle of our linkage, plus one half AOM, one half of that central angle, has to be equal to pi. That's what we figured out up here. But I'm going to replace what I know about AOM from this formula. So I'm just substituting it in here. And I'm simplifying. I'm solving for APM. So now I've got a new expression that relates my linkage angle APM to AMO, this angle right up here. Now, why is that useful? Well, it's useful because AMO, this angle up here, is part of the linkage angle that I got by just you know, laying a ruler here, laying a ruler here, and taping them together. This is AMO. This is just a right angle. It's 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians. So I know that about AMC is that AMC is this 90 degree angle right here pi over 2 plus this angle now AMO that I've learned something about. Okay so if I know that AMC is pi over 2 plus AMO I've already learned up here by doing algebra that A APM, the linkage, once it's moved to some other point along the curve, APM is also pi over 2 plus AMO. So if I've got two things that are equal to pi over 2 plus AMO, they must be equal to each other. And so the linkage angle, as I set it up by putting my ruler along here and my other ruler along here and attaching them, that has to equal this angle here that happens when I slide that linkage writing along this pen and this pen. So that's why that construction works. It's a little bit challenging to wrap your head around. Okay, let's be, be honest, it's a, it's a lot challenging, but it's an example of how we take a lot of Euclid's fundamental ideas and assimilate them all together in order to build a useful tool it doesn't just seem to work because we demonstrate that it de did on this particular example so that we know it works.
Okay, well, we've got about as much in place for using or for constructing families of circular arcs to be used as fundamental building blocks for more complex curves. So before we go on and build any more complex curves, it's worth looking at our other alternative, or one other alternative, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> one other alternative for these simple building block curves. And those are ellipses. And you're not going to find ellipses really anywhere in Euclid's elements. Not, not in the sense of a curve that you construct with a compass and a straight edge like you can with circular arcs. They're not constructible in that sense. Um, so we need to, to, to well, we're not going to really understand why they're not constructible, but to, to understand how we can at least approximate an ellipse, we're going to need to know what an ellipse is. And so if you're given two points in space, F1 and F2, in the plane, so the two points in the plane, all an ellipse is, is it's the set of all other points P that if you measure the, their distance from the point, the measure, if you measure the distance from this point P to the first given point F1 and the second given point F2 and add those distances together, you're going to get, do it for this one value of P, you're going to get a constant value, some number, some magnitude. So then if you go and look through the plane for all other points, such that if you were to draw lines from that point to those two given points, sum their distances up. If you were to get that same distance, then that's just going to be some other point on this curve that I'm calling an ellipse. So that's all an ellipse is. Now, if we were to impose, this is one useful fact that will help us with making sense of some of our constructions later on, maybe. If we were to impose a coordinate system on this ellipse and make sure that the x-axis of that, that Cartesian coordinate system contains those two given points that we're going to call focal points, or the foci, and it contains them not just anywhere, but in such a way that those two foci are equidistant from the origin of this coordinate system. Therefore, the y-axis is um, the line that's equidistant from those two foci. Then an ellipse is going to be the set of all points a and or x and y that satisfy this equation here for some choice of a squared and b squared. And a squared and b squared are going to be related to the locations of the foci because these foci, it's going to turn out, they are located at coordinates negative c comma zero and positive c comma zero on the x-axis. All right, and so that's a analytical geometry way of representing an ellipse is the set of all points that satisfy this equation. Now, if you had some computer software, you could make a choice for A and B. Turns out that those are just going to be the left and rightmost extremities, plus or minus A, and the lowest, uh, bottom and topmost extremities, negative B and positive B, that the ellipse passes through on that axis. You know, your software could graph that for you. But we'd like to be able to do, graph this by hand because ellipses, or at least arcs of ellipses, can be nice sometimes for design. Notice that they have vertical ta tangents at their horizontal extrema, horizontal tangents at their vertical extrema, and that can be a nice property when you want to do something like, say, form an arc, form an arch. So this upper half of the ellipse might make a nice archway that is inscribed inside of a rectangle. It's just elliptical instead of circular like the construction that we just looked at a minute ago. So it's an elliptical 
arcs, part or all of them can also just be alternatives to connecting two points. And they can be asymmetric curved arcs that connect two points as opposed to the symmetric um, curves that we get when we're using circular arcs. So sometimes that can be kind of nice. It can make a uh, make a uh, interesting visual effect in, in your design. And then it's, instead of using the upper half or lower half of the ellipse as, as some sort of a profile or arch, you could use the right or left half and that can form like a bullnose profile that goes all the way around the edge of a countertop or a tabletop or something like that. So we'll explore those kinds of applications and more, but we do need to be able to construct an ellipse. So we could ask ourselves, can we do that? And you know, like, like many things, the answer is sort of. Um, yes, we can do it, but it's really not going to be in the Euclidean way. It's not something that just involves the use of a compass and a straight edge. There's actually three techniques that we'll use to accomplish this task. Well, our first method for constructing an ellipse is one that involves basically just coming up with a series of sample points or control points around the elliptical curve. And it's, this, this is a technique called Steiner projection. Steiner was a 18th century geometer and um, you know this, this method is credited to him. So here's how it works. We've got we basically got a length of A and a length of B in mind, the major and minor axis length of the ellipse that you know we want that ellipse to satisfy as a property. And so if we draw a rectangle that is 2a wide and 2b tall, twice the minor axis tall, twice the major axis wide, then draw, connect the midpoints of the top and bottom and the midpoints of the left and right side to get crosshair that goes through the center of the rectangle, then I need to do some dividing. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a number of divisions, and it could be any any number. All right, and I'm going to divide this upper half of the left side up into that many pieces. In this case, I think I did it seven pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. All right. Well, then I'm going to do the same thing down here, and I'm going to do the same thing here and here, and from top to this middle axis, I'm going to label those numbers 0 through 7. And then if I were to go through elsewhere, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd label these 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And maybe from the bottom go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and that one's already 7. All right. Now, I'm going to do the same thing along these horizontal axes. I'll start at the middle and divide this horizontal half axis into the same number of pieces. They're not going to be the same size as these di divisions, but it's the same number of divisions. So I've divided this half axis into seven equal pieces. And I've labeled those divisions 0 through 7. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seven's down here a little bit. All right, and that's, I could do the same thing going this way. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. All right. Now the reason for having those numbers, I hope, is going to come cl become clear in a minute. But here's what I'm going to do. I am going to start at this top midpoint of the top side of the rectangle. And I'm going to draw lines connecting that top midpoint to these numbers on the right side, 0 through 7. So it forms this fan of lines. And then from the bottom midpoint, I'm going to draw lines that pass through these edges, 0 through 7, along the horizontal half axis, radiating up like this. And so then what I do is 
I connect, I, I, go, I go and look for where the corresponding rays intersect. So the zeros, they intersect right here. The ones, they intersect right here. The twos intersect here, the threes intersect here, the fours intersect here, the fives here, the sixes here, and the sevens down here at the right edge. And so I mark, I darken those intersections. And then either with a French curve or a blending curve, which is just a flexible ruler, um, or even freehand, I try my best to smoothly connect those dots and I get an approximation to an ellipse. And where the approximation comes in is in between the dots, because it turns out that those intersections are exact pinpoint locations of points along the elliptical curve. So it's just, you know, my freehanding or even using a, a curve aid like a French curve to connect them, that's where the error is going to come in. So if I want to minimize the error on this construction of this part of the elliptical arc, all I'd have to do is make something, make more than seven subdivisions. You know, do 10 or 12 or whatever I can manage. It's going to get to the point where the picture is so busy, you're going to have a hard time finding your intersections of corresponding rays. But within reason, you can get a pretty good and accurate quarter arc of an ellipse this way. And if you want the whole ellipse, well, I could get the elliptical arc. To, there's two ways. I could just go ahead and repeat the process in these four quad, the remaining three of the four quadrants. By this time, now drawing lines from T through the horizontal lines here and B through the vertical marks here and looking for their corresponding intersections. And that's going to give me an arc here. And then the mirror image of the same thing over here. But I actually wouldn't do that. If I wanted to draw the full ellipse, I'd just get out a piece of tracing paper and copy this arc that I've carefully drawn. And then I will go and take that that tracing paper to a rigid template, like a piece of like polycarbonate plastic or even just a piece, thin piece of plywood, mark out that quarter arc, flip it over, trace it out again, flip it down, trace it out below it, flip it over one more, trace it out over here. And I get get my my uh, ellipse traced out and I make sure it's it's symmetric that way. So that's the first method for constructing an ellipse, and it works pretty well, especially if you are working with a compass and a straight edge on you know, a piece of paper about at this scale. I would not use this technique if I was trying to create an ellipse on a large scale layout just because it's, it's um, well, I mean, I guess I could, but it would just be kind of tedious coming up with these divisions accurately. And, um, it's, you know, it's, it's just a lot of work in general. That's, that's really the downside of this technique is that it's, it's kind of slow and tedious. So it'd be nice if there were some improvements. Well, one improvement or one alternative to the Steiner projection method of, an, of constructing an ellipse is to use a string and two nails. And this is, this is the technique for drawing ellipses that I would hazard the guess that most people are the most familiar with. And what it does is that it, it takes advantage of the definition of an ellipse. So if you can imagine kind of reverse engineering the technique, if we've already got an ellipse drawn, and you know, pardon my freehanded sketch here, I know it's not really an ellipse, but imagine you had an ellipse drawn and you located the foci of the ellipse. Let's actually take a minute to see how you would do that. Because earlier I gave you the relationship between this distance zero to C and the major axis length and the minor axis length. This would be a good place to highlight it. The major axis length a squared is equal to the minor axis length b squared plus this distance from the origin to the focus. And that 
formula looks a lot like the Pythagorean theorem formula with just the symbols a, b, and c permuted. It's telling you about the relationship between the sides of a right triangle where b is this short leg, c is this long leg, and a is the length of the hypotenuse. Well, if I just had an ellipse drawn on a set of Cartesian axes like this, then I could very easily find the links A and B just by measuring, you know, measuring A out that way, and then maybe with another compass measure from the origin to B if I wanted it. So the only quantity that's not known in this relationship here is C. Well, I could just imagine then trying to draw this right triangle where this is one leg, this is a right angle with the length C, and this is the hypotenuse right here, it's length A. Well, I can do that. I can find where that hypotenuse should intersect this x-axis to find the location of C, and I just do it by measuring A, sweeping an arc from B, and where that arc intersects this x-axis, that's going to be the length of C. Because see, that gives me this right triangle where the short leg is B, this other leg is C, and the hypotenuse is A. So if I've got a drawing of a ellipse, I can always find the location of the two foci if I've got a compass and I know about the Pythagorean theorem. And that's great because now I can plot the location of the two foci in this picture. And then that's really 90% of the battle because if I know that an ellipse is just the set of all points that for which the sum of the distances from that point to one focus and the other focus remain constant no matter where you are along the perimeter of this ellipse, if it's a set of all points, then all I really need to do is pick a point, it's one way to do it, pick this point or maybe even this point more conveniently, and then imagine stretching a string from this point C, or negative C, all the way to A and then back to C. And then that distance should be the same, that string should be the same as a string that I stretch from C up to this point on the elliptical curve, down to C, or from negative C up to this point along the elliptical curve, back down to positive C. I should be able to stretch that same string all to all points of the elliptical curve from these two foci. And so if I do that, I can imagine setting that string up and then putting a marking instrument like a pencil into um, against that string and just drag the strings around and trace out this curve. Well, no sense in imagining that. Here is an ellipse I'd like to reproduce on a rectangle. So from here to here is the length of the major axis, A. From here to here is the length of the minor axis, B. And so if I wanted to find the location of the foci, never mind the fact that I've got two nails driven through it, all I would have to do is measure the, minor, the major axis length Swing an arc from the top peak of the, this is going to be kind of hard, swing an arc. I'm going to do it down here so you can actually see what's going on. So I'm, I'm down here on the bottom of my, my ellipse, swinging an arc, and it intersects the major axis right where my nail is. All right, and I do the same thing on the other side. then I would drive a nail through those two intersections, which is what I've already done here. Then what I want to do is take a string, 
put a couple of loops in either end of the string. And in this particular string, I've got a fixed loop here, and then I've got another loop that I've tied with a knot that slides up and down the string to make it a little bit, a little bit adjustable. And then what I want to do is make it wrap around this point here, the far right of the major axis, and then come back and loop over this nail. And we can see that it actually does that if I loop both ends. Now if you fashion one of these strings with a fixed loop on one end and a sliding loop on this end, and you don't get it quite right, that's what the sliding loop is for. You can adjust it. All right, and so now I've set my string to the right length. Well, with the string length set appropriately, all you really need to do is attach the two loops to the nails at the focal points, nails at the foci, put a pencil or some other marking instrument into the string, and trace, try to keep my hands out of the way so you can see what's going on, Trace your way around, and then you're going to run into problems with the nail, or with the knot. And we've just traced out the upper half, and then if we want to trace out the lower half, well, just come around to the other side. And there's the ellipse, and so it works. It's a little clunky on a small scale like this, especially with a knotted string such as the one that I'm working with. And for that reason, I, I really wouldn't use this on something that's at the same scale as, you know, a design that you'd draw on paper. The larger the scale, the more accurate and the better this is going to work, the less of an impact things like these little knots are going to have relative to the, the overall all design. Um, you just need to make sure that you're working with a string that's got a fairly low stretch to it. Um, so that's, you know, that's a perfectly uh, adequate way of, of marking out an ellipse. And it is a technique that you can use for an ellipse of any size, you know, any given major axis and minor axis combination. You know, so you just use the major axis to swing an arc from the top of the minor axis to where it intersects the major axis to find the location of the two foci. And then, as I said, either fabricate, fashion a looped string that goes from negative A to A, or loop it loop your string over one of the foci, stretch it all the way to the opposite minor axis, major axis, and then make sure that the looped end comes back to that other fo focus. Either, either one is equivalent, and it, it, it's a way to set the length of your string. And if it's a little long or short, having a sliding knot at one end a little bit hard to slide tonight because my fingers are frozen. Um, but anyway, having a sliding knot on your, your, your string can make this an adjustable layout. All right, and so that is our second method for making an ellipse. Well, there's one more method that I'll typically use for laying out an ellipse, and this is another one that works. This one actually works reasonably well across scales if you change up the material that you're wanting to use for your, your, um, your construction. So same problem. If we are given both the length of the major axis and the minor axis, where the major axis A is greater than the minor axis, we want to draw an ellipse. So similar setup to what we saw before, we'll draw a set of Cartesian axes mark out the locations of the horizontal extremities and the vertical ex extremities that are distance plus or minus a to the left and right, plus 
or, or minus b up or down. And instead of using a string, what we're going to do is just get a strip of paper. And on that strip of paper, on one edge, make sure it's a straight edge strip of paper, but on one edge, I'm going to mark a reference point, P. And what I'm going to do with that reference point is that I'm going to measure the length of the minor axis from P to the origin. So from B to the origin, I'm making a mark from P down to here. And I'm going to intentionally mislabel that. I'm going to write major instead of minor at that point. And I'm going to do the same thing along the major axis. I'm going to put P at the origin on my strip. And then I'm going to mark where A falls on that strip. And I'm going to intentionally mislabel that as minor. Now the way this strip is going to work is that if I just pick a spot to do it, yeah, here we'll do it here. If I take the point that's labeled minor and put it on the minor or vertical axis and then rotate this little strip around until the point that says major is on the major axis, then where P is, I'm going to make a dot. Then I'm going to keep doing that. And I'll find a different location where the minor mark on my strip lines up with the minor axis and the major axis, my major mark on my strip lines up with the major axis. And I keep doing this. Repeatedly. Then do it for some points up above as well. Pretty good alignment. Too far, maybe. And I hope, you know, what you can see is that eventually, as you lay these out, you get a series of dots that if you were to carefully connect them with a smooth, fair curve, the dots are going to form an arc of an ellipse. The more dots you make, the easier it is to connect them smoothly. And those dots are, if you were taking care to line up the major mark with the major axis and the minor mark with the minor axis and carefully marking where P falls on your paper, then they are exact. They, they line up exactly with locations on the curve of the ellipse. So it's only the gaps between that you try to freehand connect or use a French curve or whatever that you're going to run into any error. So the more dots, the better your accuracy. And then you can work your way around the rest of the ellipse if you want by just choosing different pairs of major and minor axes for locating the marks on your, your strip. Um, and you can get the full ellipse that way, or you can just be satisfied with a quarter of an ellipse, cut it out as a template, and flip and rotate to get the remaining three quadrants of your ellipse. Now that's certainly one way that you could, you know, use this technique. And it works reasonably well, at, you know, on the small scale, you know, paper size design. I wouldn't want to lay out an ellipse like this with, you know, on a full scale object, like trying to create a, an elliptical archway that was part of an entrance into a room with a strip of paper. I think that would flop around too much to be useful. But you can make a more mechanical rigid structure to do the same job. And this is called a trammel, but it's the same principle. 
So I've got, I've already set this up so that it'll work, but I've got this rectangle here where I've drawn the axes that basically connect the midpoints of the pairs of opposite sides. And what I've done is that I've taken a trammel, a beam, and I've drawn a line through it that now currently has a pencil board through it for reasons that we'll understand in a minute. I've drawn a line through that, that beam and I've marked that as P as my reference point. And so then I would measure the distance from the origin to the end of the major axis and I put a mark there and from the origin up to the minor axis length and I put a mark there. And I actually backward labeled these. I to follow the same technique that I here I'll fix it now. I should have labeled the short one major and the long one minor. I'm fixing that off camera. And so now this is labeled just like my old trammel paper was, but for a different sized ellipse. I'm going to use this the same way with one difference. So I am going to put the minor pin on the minor axis, the major pin on the mi major axis, and now I'm just going to ride it along this square, this little layout square. It doesn't ride real smooth because this board is not real smooth. But I'm going to ride my pencil come out. Try to ride these along. And it's just kind of the continuous version of marking points. That this pencil P is tracing out the uh, tracing out the locations of all the points along the ellipse. And if you had a smoother board, one that you hadn't used as a board to cut insulation against, so you've got all these knife grooves on it, it would have it would have ridden a little bit smoother. But we can see that it's trying to trace out an elliptical curve. And earlier when I was practicing this, you can see that I did another one on the opposite quadrant there. And so that works pretty well, but where that really works is if you want to make a big one. So this process of having a rigid beam with a marking point and then the reference pins for your major and minor axis works really well at full scale because you can make a square track by nailing it to you know a sheet of plywood or something like that along the crosshairs and then drive some nails through a rigid board and drill a hole to put a pencil through, and with some helpers you can do just what I was trying to do. You know, ride your pins along the two beams of the square that go along the major and the minor axis, and you'll eventually trace out a pretty clean elliptical curve that you can then make a template out of. You could take a jigsaw and cut it out and use it as a template for making copies of that elliptical shape. So this is really no different than what I was doing on paper with this strip, except instead of taking a finite number of samples, sample points along my curve, I'm just tracing the curve continuously. So those are the three techniques for tracing out an ellipse that I would usually use. Now there is another one. I'm not going to show it to you, frankly, because I just don't like it. There's another one called the four center method. And if you search for constructing an ellipse on YouTube, you'll find plenty of videos that show you how to do it. But what it's doing is connecting, it's basically forming two circles, like here and here, of smaller radii, and then two bigger circles here and here of bigger radii in such a way that they, you can jump from one circle to this other one, back to the small one, back to the big one, in a way that looks pretty smooth. And 
it is an approximation of an ellipse, but only at a few points. And then elsewhere, the, the curves stray from what the true ellipse would be that has that same major and minor axis combination. And for the amount of trouble it, you go through to form that construction, I'd, I'd just as soon do one of these other ones to get more points that actually fall on the ellipse. So that four center construction creates what's called an oval rather than an ellipse. And, and I just, I don't use it that much. So we're left really asking ourselves, I think, what, what can we do with these elliptical building blocks and these circular arc building blocks? And really the answer to that is that we can build more complex curves that can form curved design elements in our plans for furniture, plans for architecture. And one place where you might do that is to create what are called um, piecewise circular curves. What I mean by that is that imagine, well, we can see it right in front of us. We're gonna take some circular arcs and figure out ways to join them together so that it appears like you're going from one arc to another that in, a, in a smooth transition. And book three of the elements gave us a couple of different propositions that hinted how we would go about constructing these piecewise circular arcs. We had a proposition that told us about the relationship between the centers and the point of tangency of two circles that are tangent to one another, either internally tangent or externally tangent. And when we were looking at those propositions, I think I said that the application of the um, externally tangent circles, two circles that touch each other like that, is that you can ride along an arc of the big circle and then once you pass through the point of tangency, smoothly jump off onto an arc of the small circle and you get these graceful S-shaped curves and those curves are called SEMA curves. Now we might want to connect the endpoints of a line segment with a SEMA curve rather than just a simple circular arc. And the way to do that would be to cut up that line segment into some number of pieces, at least two. So you've got one point that's going to be the point that you go from the large arc to the small arc. Well, and here's how you'd lay that out. And then I'm gonna, even though it'll mess up my picture, I'm gonna give you a sense of how that relates to that, that um, proposition from book three about externally tangent circles. These arcs, what I'm going to do is once I've divided my segment up into, into two pieces, so I've divided this segment in, up into five pieces and said, well, I want the first piece to occupy three segments and the second piece to occupy two so that those, that segment has been divided into a three to two ratio pair. So I'm going to measure the length of that first three, three part segment and I'm going to draw a sixth of an arc that lies on that segment by basically doing my equilateral triangle construction. And there it is. Now it's a little bit off from what I did before because I'm being kind of sloppy. All right, and then I'm going to do the same thing but on the other side of the line for the two-part segment. So I'm going to find its center up here to anyway. Oh, terrible. Hands are so cold tonight, nothing's working well. Then draw that arc. All right, so how, what's that have to do with externally tangent circles? Well, if I were to continue those arcs all the way around, go back and redraw most of this circle.
we can see that we've got two circles there that are externally tangent. And it's just from here to here that we're keeping at those circle, keeping that those those circles, and that's our our sigma curve. Now, there's no reason why you couldn't generate a sigma curve using something other than a sixth of an arc. You know, you could imagine finding the center down here of a, a slower arc, one that had twice the radius of the sixth of the arc, and then sweep a curve that's, you know, maybe looked something like that. You could do that. And your SEMA curve is going to look good as long as the arc that you perform or form over here is similar to the one that you made here. So this was a sixth of an arc for this chord, and this was a sixth of an arc for this chord. I wouldn't want to do a quarter of a circle and a third of a circle, because then what's going to happen is that they're going to meet at a kink here. So you're not going to get that smooth, graceful SEMA curve. So both arcs should be thirds, both arcs should be fourths, both arcs should be twelfths, you know, whatever you want to do, just make them similar, make them the same. All right? You can generalize a SEMA curve that is just two joined arcs to many joined arcs to make these generalized wave curves, and you would do it the same way. You know, here I've divided up a longer segment into a two-part piece a four-part piece and then a one-part piece and you know I've already found their centers these are each arc on this linkage here is a sixth once again right and so trace that one trace that one and then back down here That one's another sixth, just for that shorter segment. And they still merge together smoothly. And you get this graceful curve that, you know, it looks like maybe it could be the side of a mountain dulcimer or some sort of a musical instrument. You can lay things like that out using these piecewise circular curves. And so what you should do is experiment with different arc radii or segment division ratios. So you might want to take something like this, divide it into three pieces and two pieces, and see how it looks when you use quarter of a circle arcs, or a third of a circle of arcs, or arcs that have radii that are twice that of the sixth of a circle arc. You know, go back to your visual scale of chords and see how to find the centers for the different radii and experiment how that impacts the way that SEMA curve looks. And do the same thing here. Or experiment with the number of subdivisions that you use for one piece relative to the other. And you can, you can start seeing how you can get all kinds of these different graceful S-shaped or wave-shaped curves that can play different roles in your designs. These could be parts of molding profiles. They could be the edges on a very organically shaped tabletop. They could be any number of things. You just have to use your imagination. And we'll explore some of those applications in our upcoming and final design workshop for this initial geometry and design series. Piecewise curves don't necessarily need to be made up of circular components, circular arc components. You could link to elliptical or more components together at a joint smoothly. And that's what I've done in this picture here. As you know, ellipses are considerably more involved to construct than a circle. You know, you don't have a just a simple compass that allows you to draw them. So this would be more of a painstaking process. Um, but 
what you can do is you can go out and buy these ellipse drafting templates and I don't remember which ones that I used that, that looks like that's maybe it right there and if you've got if you've got a distance both vertically and horizontally that you want to span these things have crosshairs that are lightly drawn on them and you can line them up with the X and Y directions of that distance and then just trace out a little part of an elliptical arc and then take that same arc or even a different one I don't remember really what I did when I was laying this out and connect it so you get these smooth S-shaped elliptical curves and um, you start having to amass a kind of a collection of these so that you get enough um, I think that's a chunk of hay on my um, <laughs> My ellipse template that's great um, so that you can get enough elliptical curve templates to draw these but you know that is an option and some of the Greek molding profiles make more use of those elliptical um, curves like I did here and it's a, it's interesting how much of a difference that can do have in the way that shadows are cast on this profile than if we'd use circular arcs. Now speaking of molding, I wanted to just give you a series of examples of classical molding profiles that are made up of arcs and piecewise arcs. These are all circular but there's no reason that you couldn't make similar versions of these using elliptical arcs. I just frankly was running out of time and energy when I did did this drawing so I, I used a compass to make circular arcs and so there, it's really just some vocabulary here to know what these molding profiles look like and what I mean by a molding profile is that if I had a stick of lumber um, then this would be the cross section you'd be looking at oh, dropping my pencil this would be the cross section that you'd be looking at when that lumber is sticking straight out of the page if you cut through it. This is the profile. So these were the, would be the kinds of things that you would put under a fireplace mantle or along a baseboard in a room or um, crown molding up at the uh, junction between the ceiling and the top of the wall or even on various pieces of furniture like uh, along the top of a fancier chest of drawers. Okay, so different names. A cavetto or a cove is just a piece of molding where you've carved out a concave arc. All right, and so this cavettos or co coves often appear in crown molding in rooms or on pieces of furniture. An ovalo is just the opposite of that. It's a convex curve that's bulging out on the the um, edge of, of, of the molding. The way I constructed both of these is that I started with a rectangle, divided the width and the height into, you know, based on some module. I, I don't remember what these were. Uh, three to four, two to three, something like that. And then take a step of a fraction of that module in, a couple steps up. The numbers aren't really important. You just, you, you can, that's something that you can experiment with. So the, this is a vertical line, this is a horizontal line. Then I imagined the segment connecting those, and in this case I just drew a sixth of an arc. I could experiment by doing faster arcs or slower ones to have more or less dramatic coves. Same with the ovalo. Stepped in a little bit, stepped up a little bit from the bottom, but this time drew a sixth of an arc that connected those points that was convex rather than concave. Well, if you can connect two points with simple arcs, you can connect two points with SEMA curves. And there's really two ways you can do that. One with the concave 
part of the SEMA curve at the top of the molding and one at the convex part of the SEMA curve at the top of the molding. And those are called SEMA recta or OGs and SEMA reversa or reverse OGs. They're kind of two versions of the classical names of those profiles. And then just another variation is that you can take a complex molding that's made up of two of the existing molding profiles that we have, a cove and an ovalo stacked right on top of each other, yet separated by this small step called a fillet. Um, and those can all just be laid out, with, since these were circular arcs, just by dividing up this, these rectangular spaces into you know, sectors and spanning these diagonal distances with different types of, of circular, or if you wanted to, even elliptical curves. That would work as well. A lot of times when you're designing a room or designing a piece of furniture, you could certainly use off-the-shelf molding profiles. You could just go down to the home center and buy sticks of molding that are pre-cut. But you might find that you are restoring an existing piece of furniture or restoring architecturally an old house or an old building that has all these old pieces of molding that have been damaged somehow. And so then you'd want to find a good piece, take its cross section, and try to figure out how it was constructed so that you could lay out a design like this and either send that design off to a a company that will grind custom cutters for you to use a, a shaper or a large router to cut your own uh, molding. Or you lay it out on the end of a board and um, take some antique or new, newly made um, hollow and round molding planes and shape your own custom molding yourself. And you'd be surprised at how good of a job those those do in a fairly short amount of time and that sometimes that's that's the quickest and easiest way to get a small amount of custom molding to match uh, something on an existing project so it's where a skill like being able to lay these these classical profiles out would would come in well there's another example of where in this case, circular arcs can form together in a piecewise smooth sense in order to create a more complex family of curves. Um, but this time, it's unlike the SEMA curves, it's based off of circles that are internally tangent rather than externally tangent. And so we're looking at a spiral pattern here. And what's going on is that roughly each quarter of the spiral is taken from a circle of a given radius. And then when we move to our next quarter of the circle, that radius changes. And then it changes again and gets smaller for the next quarter, and then the next a little bit more than a quarter, and then so on as you spiral in. So each time we go around roughly 90 degrees, the revolution of this, this spiral, the radius jumps down by a notch but it's still joined smoothly at these, these junctions. Now, laying out something like this takes a fair amount of time. And you've got to kind of lay out this crosshair pattern at such a size that is chosen to be relative to this number of modular steps in this case, there's eight from the center of this crosshair pattern to the top of my, my arc. And, you know, you've got to proceed kind of carefully, but you know, if you're organized, you understand the recipe, then you know you can quickly walk through jumping from center, readjust your compass to center, readjust your compass again working your way around this spiral 
each time you make a roughly 90 degree revolution, you make a jump to one of these new centers in this, this crosshair pattern. And that's what causes you to spiral inward. I'm not going to go through how to lay this out in detail in this tutorial. I'm mostly just trying to show an application of the internally tangent circle theorem that we had, proposition that we had from book three of the elements. You're either going to use these volute spiral curves or you're not. You know, it, it's, it's really going to just be, are you working on that kind of furniture that, high style furniture that tends to have volutes in it or um, classical architecture that has volutes appearing in places like tops of, of, of columns that support the entryway to a, to a house, or you're just not, you know, it's, it's not something that you're going to appear. A lot of times if you try to put a volute pattern into a piece of furniture where it doesn't fit, it just, it looks like this gaudy thing that's, that's out of place. So um, my opinion about these is that if, if you've got a need to learn how to lay them out, there's, then it's worth putting the time and effort into figuring it out. And otherwise, it's just, you know, maybe being aware that this is something that you can lay out with a compass and a straight edge if you want to. Um, I will put a link to another video, not created by me, that walks through the process of laying out this particular volute. But what I will say is that different crosshair patterns coupled with different you know, extreme distances from the center to the you know, top of the volute will lead to different looking results. This is the one that was borrowed from the capital on a classical Greek Ionian um, column. So there's, there's plenty of others out there. But if you start looking around, you'll see examples of, of these volutes that appear elsewhere. You know, if you look at Windsor chairs, they tend to appear on the crest rails and in some cases on the armrests. Um, if you look at violins, cellos, violas, double basses, you know, all the instruments like that in that family. And you look at the headstock where the pins are the tuning pe pegs are, um, you'll see that there's a another kind of volute that's that's been carved into the very top of that headstock. Um, and they all have different recipes that you follow to lay them out. And you just have to kind of examine them and figure out how they were laid out. And you'll go end up going through a process like the one that I started to demonstrate here. Okay, the last set of curves just in our set of examples here of, of curves and how they might appear in um, um, different types of design application are these two arches, the Gothic and the Lancet arches. And they're both constructed in a very similar way. Um, it's just that they, they, they have a different look and feel to them. Gothic arches, they, you know, they both have this pointed tip, but the point is more blunt on the Gothic arch and sharper on the uh, Lancet arch. They both appear most commonly in Gothic architecture, which is why you know, so this one's called the Gothic arch. If you look at older buildings that were made in kind of a Gothic revival style or true medieval buildings, especially old cathedrals, you'll see windows that are shaped like this. On the campus of the university where I teach, our oldest building, Main Hall, has both Gothic and Lancet arch windows all over it. So you can see these, these shapes and these forms appearing in architecture if you look hard enough. But they'll also appear in other situations. I've seen um, greenhouses fabricated uh, where they have a cross section of either a Gothic or a Lancet arch. And that's because it's kind of a strong structure, but with the sharp peak on it, um, it makes it shed snow pretty well in colder climates like the one that I live in. In addition to these greenhouse structures, I've seen, I've even seen these arches used on, on some kinds of furniture. A lot of times these might be the 
sort of a stylized leg that has a bench. Um, so we'd be looking at the bench end on. This is the edge of the bench and you've got these arched legs that support it and then going through the page in that direction there'd be another pair of legs like this on the other end of the bench. Um, I've seen the same sort of thing where looking, I mean, again, I'd be looking in on, maybe you'd make a bookshelf where you've got these suspended shelves between these vertical supports that come to the top in a gothic or a lancet arch. So it's a form that's fairly common in design, at least in some styles. And so it's worth knowing how to construct them. And luckily it's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple task. It's just, we draw a couple of circular arcs to make it. So a lot of times you'll have these gothic or lancet arches sitting on top of a rectangular space. And sometimes it's a shorter space vertically, like the ones I've drawn here. Other times they might run down vertically quite a ways, especially on some of these older buildings or cathedrals with gothic and lancet arch windows. The important thing though, is that once you've established those rectangular bases, if you're going to do it, then you're going to have a baseline that runs along the top edge of that rectangle. And for either of them, you want to divide or you want to step off, step off some distances along that baseline. And you want to make sure that it's the distance that you're stepping off is a part of the distance from one end of the rectangle to the other. With the Gothic arch, those steps are all contained inside of the arch itself. And then you pick two centers that are at least one step in from the left and the right of the extremities of your rectangle. In this case, I just did one step. That center is going to be this, this left center is going to be the center for this right circular arc. And so to draw that arc, you would take your compass, put the rotation point on the center itself, and set the marking point over there at the far extremity of the rectangle. And then just draw your arc. And then, Take that same setting, move to the other center, draw the other arc. The lancet arch works exactly the same way, except you take your steps, you take your modular step size, and take one or more steps outside of where the arch is going to be same number of steps to the right and the left of your arch and use that as your center for the arch on the opposite side of the, the structure. And so we're setting our compass like so, swing an arc, come around to the other side. Swing an arc, now my compass moved and I didn't do anything about it, so that's why it looks a little less accurate there, but it's okay. So with the lancet arch, the farther your centers are outside of the arch, the sharper this point is going to be, and also the taller it's going to be. With the gothic arch, the closer you get to the center, the more blunt it's going to be. In fact, if you cause these two centers to converge to one point in the center, then you no longer have a gothic arch at all. You've got a semicircle. I can demonstrate that. All right, so the limit of the gothic arch as these centers converge to the midpoint is the semicircle as they move outward 
these just get arbitrarily sharper and sharper and grow higher and higher. So you can you can play with that. You can play with the number of subdivisions. Uh, the sky is the limit with these, just to get different different shapes. So you can make a visual scale of Gothic arches and a visual scale of lancet arches if you wanted wanted to, and then think about how those might look as design elements in furniture or architecture that you might be designing. And so that's that's the end of our menu of curves and curved elements that we're going to have in our arsenal for adding curved elements to our designs. So when we meet again, we're going to begin applying these, these curved and curve rendering techniques to a design workshop. And rather than trying to create a whole new furniture design, a whole different piece, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and refine the three to four pieces of furniture that we've seen so far in our design workshops by adding some curves to them to soften them up. And I guess it's just three pieces of furniture, so we'll, we'll soften them up or uh, lighten them, um, make them not just more interesting to the eye and less blocky and rectilineal, but perhaps a little bit more functional because they're lighter without sacrificing strength. So that'll be our task when we meet again in our next design workshop. So thanks for listening.